Are you an early stage founder revolutionizing the future of retail? Then you're in the right place. My name is Sapna Shah, and I'm an angel investor investing at the pre-seed stage in retail tech, e-commerce, and digitally native brands. I'm also the founder of Retail X Series, an in real life event series based in New York to help early stage founders think through topics like customer acquisition, sales pipelines, branding, financial modeling, fundraising, and more. In this podcast, I interview founders and investors who've spoken at Retail X Series events in the past, and we dig deep into the tactics around key topics that early stage founders want to hear about. Welcome to the Retail X Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Retail X Series podcast. I'm your host, Sapna Shah. Today's episode is all about early DTC customer acquisition before you've raised a large round of funding. Our guest today, Meg Heath, co founder of A Day, will share her experiences and advice about how she found those early customers that helped build revenues right from its launch. Welcome to the podcast, Meg. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. I think the Listening audience is going to love some of your stories here on what you did in those early days. But before we get into that, let's start with some background. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and your company? Absolutely. So A Day is a direct consumer um, women's wear brand, and we are creating the wardrobe of the future. So every item that we make is sustainable, it's versatile, it's technical, and it's really designed for you to do a lot more with your life. Um, with a lot less. So my background is in finance, it's in venture capital, and it's with startups. I started my career at Goldman Sachs and working in investment banking. I then did my MBA on the West Coast and ventured more into uh, venture capital. I worked first at a fund called Atomico in London and then with Cowboy Ventures in Palo Alto during my MBA. And then after graduating, I was a product manager at Poshmark in Mellow Park. And, you know, during these times, it was actually at Goldman Sachs that I met my co-founder, Nina Foyharber, and she also went into venture capital later. And it was really through, you know, our life and the experiences that, you know, we really encountered as, you know, women crossing work and all the things that we wanted to get out of life. And that was why we created a day. So my co-founder had been a national level gymnast and I had done my yoga teacher training in California. And it was really these experiences that exposed us to the different types of fabric that really existed out there and how we could do a lot more with fabrics and functionality that wasn't really being taken advantage of in the fashion industry. And what, and how long ago did you launch your company? Uh, we launched our first items in 2015, but it wasn't really until kind of 2016 that, you know, we really started pursuing it with growth. And it wasn't until mid-2016 that we spent like our first dollar on marketing. Got it. Okay, so let's go back to the 2015 launch, mm -hmm. the earliest stages of your company. How did you start to get the word out? Did you do wait lists, pre-orders? What did you do pre-launch to kind of really get that first email list together? Absolutely. In the very early stages of building a day, like even before the company existed, even before we'd really fully vetted idea, we just spoke with a lot of people. Like every time we had a thought or an idea about anything, we would you know meet with people who knew about the sector, speak with them, get their thoughts with them. And I think one thing that we were good about, we were pretty organized about um, putting the details down, following up, and just really having a really good CRM in terms of follow up. And I think by the time that we'd actually, you know, got around to making some products, um, this list became a couple of thousand people. And once we got everyone who we were working with to really put all of their friends and their family into this list, this formed the basis of a, you know, just an email list, really. It wasn't really a customer list or anything like that. It was people who knew something about what we were doing and were interested in us as people. And I think that, you know, what a lot of people... Um, don't realize is that people are intrinsically good people and there's a lot of goodwill and people want you to succeed. So if you generally, you know, email a friend, even if you haven't seen them for like a number of years, they want to help you. And so how we started off was we just emailed everyone that we knew, people that you were at sports teams with in high school to, you know, your mothers, like neighbors, sister, and they really all helped us get the word out and to really kind of fuel this engine. We had a page up on a website where we asked people to enter their email address and 
by sharing it with more friends, they could uh, successfully you know, win greater prizes. And I think the top prize was you would get a $250 gift card upon launch. And to give you some examples of how successful this was, we had one woman who had, I'd actually only met once. I met her at a Poshmark conference, but I remember that she had complimented the outfit I was wearing and I'd liked the outfit that she was wearing, but we'd only ever had that one interaction. And she saw this on one of my social media platforms and she ended up inviting over 150 of her friends to it. So I don't think they necessarily need to be your BFF. They also don't need to be super invested, but ultimately, we do not know who is going to be interested in the idea that we're building. And I think this is really about really being thoughtful about all the people who could possibly be interested and really helping them um, leverage their network. And so through that sort of email collection process, how many emails did you start with on the day that you actually launched your first products? Over 20,000 emails. And it was actually pretty interesting because when we had that page up you couldn't actually access the website but because of that initial piece of traffic a lot of people that we didn't know were very interested in what we were doing so when we actually launched the website even before we you know sent out the launch email a number of people actually started buying and I think that this really is about how can you make it interesting and you know start building up curiosity and that purchase intent even before you talk about it. So we didn't have any wait list or pre-order before we launched. That all kind of came much later when we couldn't fulfill demand. In the beginning, it was really just about let's kind of capture uh, as much of the early interest as possible. And I, I think, you know, a lot of that early 20,000 emails wasn't necessarily helpful, right? It was a lot of like, you know, men and, you know, venture capitalists who were just interested to see what this was about. But, you know, a lot of it were, were like, you know, directly on our target audience. It, it, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I think one of the issues that I hear from entrepreneurs a lot is that, you know, they want to collect emails. They start about, you know, maybe a month before they're going to launch, but they think that, you know, the most they'll get is like 500 or 1,000. How did you parse those after the fact? To your point, you said that there were, there were men, there were venture capitalists, there were people who were clearly not interested. How did you then take those 20,000 and really understand who was going to stay on the Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, revealed preference in that, in that, you know, there's only so much that I can glean by, like, you know, looking at your email and um, your user, you know, your first name and last name and your IP address and all of these things. And these things are helpful, but ultimately it's your engagement behavior with us that's going to really help us in this. And I definitely see from, you know, our first month cohort that some of those are still our best customers. The lifetime value is, like, tremendously high and you know, a lot of those are really key, like ambassador, well, you know, really perfect type customers. Um, but they sort of tell us that, right? Like, I want to see who is opening the emails and who's clicking through and who's engaging with that and use that information to segment that rather than like, you know, kind of making up certain ideas. Because, you know, the men do buy and especially, you know, now for gifting, I do think that we have a, a you know, male audience who is very interested. And, you know, as some men are also very interested in our products. And I think, um, that's really super, um, but it's really kind of up to uh, the users to tell us rather than, you know, us necessarily putting it on into buckets. But, but I do think the point of, you know, segmenting and also passing down the lists as quickly as possible so that we can segment people at, or at least try segmenting them out and testing ideas on them is very important. Yeah, exactly. And and so you you basically it sounds like put all your eggs into this building an email list basket. Did you ever consider doing crowdfunding pre-launch? Yeah, I we definitely thought about it. I would say that crowdfunding was definitely, you know, a little bit earlier in its life cycle back then. And I think that one thing that made us nervous was around sizing and also the idea of creating a brand. We thought that, you know, rightly or wrongly, that crowdfunding was more appropriate for more commodity products, so non-fit were ones where it was really going to be about the product rather than about the brand. And ultimately, we wanted a day to stand for a lot more than just clothing. It was really about this idea that we were creating a brand that represented doing more with less. And we wanted to have customers which really empathize with the message that we were building in this world and also creating a better future. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I think we, we hear a lot from entrepreneurs about, you know, do you do sort of pre-orders? Do you do crowdfunding? 
it does sound like focusing on kind of the one thing you focused on was very successful. And I would also say here that, you know, there's no right answer and everything just because, you know, I did one thing or you did something else doesn't mean that we're right. And, you know, in also I think what people kind of forget a lot is that in all of our data points, it's just n equals one, just because it also worked out once doesn't mean it was a good idea or, you know, we should even do it again. Like I think timing is also a very different thing. I personally am fascinated by crowdfunding. And one of my dreams in the future is to just, you know, have like a pet project, which I would love to just kind of crowdfund. I'm very curious about the idea of like how, you know, that industry has evolved and is evolving. Yeah, absolutely. So let's pivot a little bit to post-launch. So you've got these 20,000 emails, you've launched some products. Obviously, you have this email base that you can reach out to. What were the other kind of channels that were most successful for you at those early stages, you know, before you could afford a lot of marketing spend? Yeah, for sure. We really focused on channels where $1 could really help, you know, not $1, but just like one um, amount of effort could really help as much kind of word of mouth as possible. And so email was actually really big on that, but we really tried to make our emails also very content-based, very interesting, so that people would share them around. We actually had a blog at that time, which we don't now, um, and that was more of like a mistake that we don't have it anymore. But we had launched this blog pre-launch actually um, because we were interested in what sort of voice our users would engage with and how people would interact with uh, our website, um, you know, what articles they were really curious about. And that blog was feeding a lot of the initial content from the emails. Um, we also had a refer a friend function. I would say this was like decently successful. It wasn't amazing, but we spent a lot of time doing community building. Um, so offline uh, events in New York and also in London. We would partner with companies like Sweetgreen, um, do like a lot of running clubs, but really understand and get to know um, the customers on a one-on-one -on -one basis, what they cared about, you know, what music they liked, what was important to them. I think that this was very successful in many ways. It really allowed us to learn so much about our customers, but it was also incredibly resource intensive. You know, I think looking back, I would have probably started some of the paid marketing earlier, um, but really like you know, my co-founder and I don't come from like a clothing or a fashion background. And we were just very curious about our consumers. And this really helped us answer a lot of, you know, the things and allow us to really kind of see this brand come to life in an offline format. And we also um, did hire a PR agency early on. And that was incredibly successful because um, I think, you know, as with startups, we don't have that much budget. So we also, the PR agency was also a pretty startup PR agency. And they allowed us to, to visit so many editors and really get our story out there across so many people. And we were just sort of, you know, dragging a small suitcase of all of our items around town. And this allowed us to share our story with so many people and then we were able to kind of put that back onto social media and put that back onto email and you know a couple of months later put that back onto paid social you know it's interesting that you mentioned press this is the most controversial topic when i talk to founders um early stage of press and hiring pr agencies and i know You've had strong feelings about it. You had some success at the early stages. Over time, how has PR worked for you and, and how have agencies worked for you? Have you continued with the same agency since, um, since your launch? We have uh, switched uh, agencies a few times. We've had a number of good experiences. I wouldn't say we've had any like really poor experiences. I would say that more, you know, the returns are very inconsistent, but overall it has definitely been positive. Um, and I would say that press has been more of a catalyst. So if, you know, if you do not have anything to share, then, you know, it's unlikely to do something. But if you, there are interesting stories to be told, really cool products that one is launching, then definitely, you know, there will be um, outlets that want to cover it. But I think, you know, initially we thought that if we could just, you know, hire an agency, they would do all the work. And now our view is very much we have to create, you know, the cool stories and, you know, news lines for them to be able to have something to work with. 
So it's definitely, you know, more useful in a time when there are more products being launched, you know, more partnerships, more newsworthy stories, more collaborations happening. They can't make magic out of nothing. And, and it sounds like, you know, you've had a lot of newsworthy things to say, uh, particularly because of the focus on sustainability and the fabrics you use and all of, all of those things have also been kind of very of the moment in, you know, particularly recently. And perhaps that does help in getting that. I would say that's absolutely correct. But I also, you know, I would say that it's not really, you know, us. I would say that a lot of it is about, you know, describing what you're doing in a smart and relevant way. Like ultimately, you know, news has to be relevant and kind of press worthy. But I am very convinced that all founders out there can, you know, that there is a relevant angle on what they are creating, even if it's not like, you know, 100% relevant, but maybe we take a certain angle at it. Or, you know, I think another way of doing it, it could be, you know, um, talking to journalists with more of an industry angle and saying, hey, here's the trend that I'm seeing with, you know, uh, this company, this company, and also us. Um, and this is, you know, all of the trends that are happening right now. And here's how we fit into it, rather than necessarily making it about like me, 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 or us, us, us. And I would say that, you know, a lot of these are like long term investments and long term relationships. And, you know, perhaps people perhaps give up too early because I, I think many times we are having like several meetings, like two, three, sometimes even maybe four or five meetings before there's a good, you know, a worthy piece of meaty piece of article written about a day. But I think that ultimately, you know, as a founder, I think one of the main things that we do is we are storytellers, whether that's a storyteller within our company, to our employees, to our customers, or, you know, to the news. And the more chances we get to tell and refine our story, you know, that's an additional chance I get to kind of A-B test the you know, narrative that I'm sharing, which then I can then use on social media and email and, you know, all the other channels. And, you know, it, it's constantly about trying to figure out what is the best angle that lands on not only news, but also customers. Yeah, I love that, that you're a storyteller. And I think that that's a really great lens to kind of to think through for press PR and, and for these other channels. And let's talk about some of those other channels. So you mm-hmm. mentioned that you would have liked to do you know, looking back on it, you might have started paid advertising a little bit earlier. When did you start paid and and what sort of successes and I don't want to say failures, but what things worked well and what didn't work as well in those early days? I, I mean, you know, with hindsight, I probably would have, you know, hired or started working with someone who knew, um, you know, was an expert in paid social um, pretty early on. I think even if, you know, one doesn't want to do um, paid acquisition early on, there's really like no excuse to do, uh, to not do um, paid retargeting uh, and to just kind of scoop up the, you know, customers who are very, very close to being customers. Um, And I think, you know, even very early on, we didn't do any of that because we just really didn't know much about it. Early on, we experienced a lot of success on Facebook and Instagram, and we still continue to experience a lot of success on Facebook or Instagram. And I think the challenge now is that it's very driven by, you know, creative and that, you know, is both costly and um, high effort to test. Uh, But early on, a lot of, you know, uh, cool things were sharing a third party article, like a news article from press about your company would often work very well and it just generally used to be much cheaper whereas I would say for someone starting out now I would look at Facebook and Instagram um, to try and scoop up people who are much further down the funnel and see if you can get people into your funnel to your website through other means. That's some good advice and that's that's really interesting advice. I think many entrepreneurs who are starting out today are finding these channels to be way too expensive. They have a waste of big ground. So I think that your advice about that, as well as the, you know, at least starting with the retargeting, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but that makes a ton of sense. So thank you for sharing that advice. Let, let's talk about the other, the other sort of main thing that I feel like was really important in your early strategy, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, mm-hmm. but 
you had a physical showroom in pop pretty early on. And that was back before, I think we, we're seeing more of that today with very early stage startups, but you were doing that even before it became sort of more popular to do those. So tell me about why you did that and what was your thought process and, and was it successful? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, initially it was just customers would sometimes appear at our office and ask if we had items. So, you know, after a couple of items, uh, after a couple of customers did that, it felt like, you know, maybe we should just invite people into the office. I think what we definitely didn't, you know, expect was how disruptive it was going to be. And, you know, we thought that, you know, oh, you know, there's like six people in the office, we can just staff this. But actually having someone who, you know, really takes care of the customers is actually a very different thing. Um, so we very much had to separate that into a physical showroom and someone was staffed on it um, and really knew how to, you know, greet and like help all the customers. Um, and that was just tremendously helpful, you know, really hearing, seeing the customers in person. And a lot of the stories, like even when people email in the story through, you know, to customer experience, you really see stories, you know, come to life. And one of my favorites was I, this um, girl had just graduated from high school and she and her mother actually flew in from Toronto and they came in straight from the airport with their carry-on suitcases. And the deal was, because she'd finished high school, her mother asked her what she wanted to do. And she said that she wanted to visit all of her favorite brands in real life. And she was like coming to visit us and then going across the road to visit Glossier and going to visit Everlane. And it was all these like brands where in in Canada, she'd only ever seen before on Instagram, but she really wanted to understand them IRL. And I think that really perfectly captured, you know, why a physical presence is so important because People, you know, understand and see these brands now on, you know, Instagram and Facebook, but are we real? And like, what does this really stand for? And how does this really truly link to, you know, even when you are someone who buys all of your products online, like you never really 100% know what you're going to get from that first purchase. Um, and I think that's why everyone who has invested in offline presence has really seen big gains in lifetime value, in average order value, because it is a very different experience seeing the product um, offline. And for us, one of the challenges that we have is, I think there are unique things about our fabric, which are really hard to convey through our website. You know, some of our hand feels are so soft. Um, our fabrics are really just world class and people get it immediately um, when they visit us. And we now have a, a physical showroom in New York on West Broadway. And we also have a store in San Francisco. And some of the comments we get online are like, you know, people say that, oh my God, this is actually much better quality than I expected. And I wish that we were able to convey that more. Um, so I think for any brand where you think that your product is like awesome and you're really proud of that, it's just a known brainer to have some level of physical showroom offline presence. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear you because as a customer of your brand, I know that the fabric feel is amazing and it's really hard to get that across offline. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about stores, you know, You've opened stores and showrooms a little earlier than most DTC companies. Are you continuing to open more stores or are you set for now? Yeah, we're definitely looking at new locations. I, I think the big challenge about opening it up before kind of Series A or Series B is that, you know, any physical presence obviously kind of costs money to do it well. And you either have to be okay with just spending a little bit more or having a presence where, like, you're not 100% happy with everything. Um, so I do think, you know, especially, like, at seed stage or pre-seed stage, a lot of these things are a little bit of a challenge. I remember that, you know, you know, even today, like, and so now we are post-Series A, we raised a $8.5 million Series A. I think a lot of things we do a little bit janky. We could have invested more. <laughs> but then when you look at the fit out of like, you know, an 1,000, a 1,000 square foot space in New York and the fit out is like, you know, 150, 200K, it's a lot of money. And yeah. So, you know, where, how does that payback look and how much do you want to sacrifice what this looks and feels like versus the upfront investment? I think it's a really hard decision. 
absolutely. And have you considered other physical presence models like wholesale or something like a neighborhood goods or show fields, you know, what I like to call offline aggregators? Yeah, we've, we've looked at um, a few of them and we have definitely tested some. I would say that they're very interesting to us and we definitely will continue to have the conversations. Um, but none of them have been like a huge, you know, like blowout success. And I think at the moment, it's more important for us to control the narrative and to really tell um, the story our way. Because I, I think that, you know, it, sometimes our story gets a little bit mixed and pushed more towards athleisure or pushed more towards just sustainability. Whereas I think our overall message is a, more simple than that, but, but, and it's important to tell that well. So I want to switch a little bit to talk more about scaling, marketing, and metrics. You talked a little bit about CAC and LTV, but what other metrics have you been focused on since the earliest days and even now through today, now that you're post-Series A? CAC and LTV are obviously incredibly important. I think um, cohort analysis is really important. I think it's something that I wish I spent more time on. And then I think, you know, really the way I like to look at data is to not go in with any assumptions and to really just kind of try and see what the data is telling you and to ask questions of the data. Um, And then, you know, if you have a teammate or have enough time, see if they look at the data and what questions that they have rather than sticking to. I think, you know, concepts like CAC or LTV are super important overall. But, you know, when looking at um, an email audience and really trying to figure out where the segments are, uh, it's also really interesting sometimes to be really open minded about where to draw the segmentation. Um, And I I think it's also like a lot of fun. I, I think just spending some time just like meshed in the data and not necessarily you know knowing um where the end goal is is very interesting in just trying to understand um the customer database and i think some of the insights i got from that was you know um i remember figuring out that uh if a customer bought one of our items the like a boss sweatshirt as part of their first order that you know it would then increase their lifetime value by like about 25%. But I didn't go into the the piece of data like looking to know that. I just wanted to understand more about first-time customers. So I I think, um, you know, going into data with intention rather than the end result is can be really interesting for kind of like learning about who your customers are. It's interesting that you say that. So you said that you were the one looking at the data do you think it's important for one of the founders to be that intimately involved? Is this something that you can hire in for later? Um, or do you think that even at your stage that the founder really needs to be involved in the data? I think the founder does not need to be like intimately involved in the data, but the founder needs to know the data very well. So I think, you know, at, at you know this point or even Later on, it's really just a choice. And um, I think where each of us are involved in, whether we're the founder or not, is really dependent on what our strengths are. Um, and if my strength happens to be data, which I, I'm, I don't know whether it is or not, because I think I've spent a lot of time with data, but I think there are definitely people out there who are better at it than I am. But someone needs to be intimately involved with the data. And that someone should be someone that you 100% trust to get the meaningful insights out of the data. But what the founder should know is about CAC and LTV and all the other kind of key metrics, you know, repeat customers, cohort analysis, um, and how that's changing. And also where um, the business needs to go and where the business needs to go and hit in terms of milestones. Um, I like building uh, data into stories. Uh, again, the key theme here. <laughs> but, but I find it both, you know, especially when talking to investors or talking to customers, it's much easier to like understand instead of saying like, here's my AOV and here's my CAC. But it's like, you know, here's a customer and, you know, her name is Rachel and she does this. And, you know, she's like 24 and she lives in the West Village and she, this is her profile. And because of this profile, like, she and this group of customers and this is like 25 percent of our population they have this sort of characteristics and their CAC and LTV is like this 
And so because of that type, because of these behaviors, this is why we're going to push them towards this, you know, marketing profile. And this is how we segment them. Because otherwise, like, the, it, it becomes very artificial and very numbers based. But I think once you make it more real, and especially, I, I think, for what we do, which is, you know, we sell women's clothing right now, and a large amount of our investors and potential investors are male, they start to really understand that customer. Yeah, for sure. And it sounds like, you know, this, your focus on data has really helped you scale kind of your marketing activities, your segmentation, all of these things. But there must have been things that sort of didn't work for you. So what what are the things that you've tried for customer acquisition and customer retention that really never worked for your company that might might have worked for other companies, but did, just didn't work for you? Sure, we hired a agency which helped us do um, conversion testing. And I, I don't know if it worked because uh, I can, like there are great pieces of analysis that I can pull up where I'm like, okay, I understand the quantitative of piece analysis and this, you know, statistical modeling, this conversion went up. Um, but it just, it, it, it feels so fluffy. I don't know whether it works or not. And, you know, with hindsight, I would have done that in a, a different way. I don't know if it, it would have been better, but it's just uh, because it was so difficult to track any change overall, we had to only look at the end conversion rate. And it just felt very, the end conversion rate was so affected by where the customers were coming from and, you know, where the traffic was coming from every month. And I think, you know, it's fine. I, I would say that based off that, I became much stricter about how I hired agencies and how I would assess them. Whereas I think before, if an agency wasn't like super expensive, I would hire them and like not worry about it too much. Whereas now I would have the strict, you know, we are hiring you for like three months and at the end of three months, here are the milestones that we need to hit. If not, then unfortunately we have to end this engagement and have much more clearer success and failure factors. I think those are good practices for, for kind of all startups, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to wrap this up. One last question. So, you know, you've given some great advice and tips throughout this conversation to um, early stage entrepreneurs who are listening to this podcast. But if you could give one piece of advice to the founders and our listening audience about customer acquisition at those very early days, what would that advice be? I would say don't get distracted. I think there's a lot of shiny things out there. And one thing that I was definitely guilty of was whenever I had a conversation with like the founder of a cool new startup and XYZ worked for them, I had a tendency to want to pivot that whole strategy to do what had worked for them. And you ultimately you only have so many resources, especially at the early stage. There are probably only a couple of shots that you can take in a big way. So focus on what you know you think is really going to be successful and actually spend some time there trying to optimize it and you know giving it a go for you know abandoning it altogether and constantly pivoting your strategy onto what is the shiniest. I love that advice and I think that is probably true beyond just customer acquisition and pretty much for everything that you're doing within your startup is don't get distracted. So thank you for sharing that. And Meg, thank you so much for sharing all your stories and experience on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. And um, anyone who wants to try out A-Day, you can use the code RITOX on our website. I love it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, audience, for listening to the Retail X podcast. We'll have another new episode out shortly. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to attend a Retail X Series event in person, check out www.retailxseries.com for upcoming events in New York. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Retail X Series. You can also learn more about me, find fundraising resources, or submit a pitch deck at www.redgiraffeadvisors.com. Thanks and catch you next time.